page or wrapping it in canvas or adding other materials. So as we were looking at the artist and her process and um, her materials, we figured that's a very nice starting point for a series of talks. Well, since she's using clay, we were looking at people that use clay. And um, our search brought us really fast to Mike. And it was assisted by our um, network of educators in town, one of them working at the Trust of Historical Preservation. Um, let me get my notes that talk about Michael. Whoops. And also my notes that talk a little bit about other programming. I will do the programming first and then I will talk about you and then it's going to be your chance to start talking about. One of the reasons we have um, the attendance we're having tonight is because we have another program happening off-site. Our Emerging Leaders in the Arts program, which is a pipeline project for diversity, they're having a reception right now downstairs in the mall in a pop-up exhibition storefront shop. And that will be from 6 to 8, so if you would like to check out what our teens are doing afterwards, we invite you to just step on down. It's right across from Sephora, right next to Seas Candy. So that's uh, where you can look at some of our emerging leaders in the art program. And I did mention other scholar talks. So after learning more about um, the mud that made the city and Adobe, in two weeks we have um, a colleague of yours, William Hyder, talk about natural pigments. And then the following week we have a um, Mr. Haskins, who is a fine arts conservator, speak about um, the tricks of conserving art. Okay, now to you. This is the part where we'll read it off. Michael Morley is the Associate Executive Director of Cultural Resources for the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. He is a specialist in history, historical archaeology, architectural history, and historic preservation with more than 30 years of experience in California. He has directed more than 50 historic and prehistoric archaeological excavations and surveys in Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, Monterey, and Ventura counties. He has served as chief archaeologist and principal investigator at the Presidio of Santa, the El Presidio de Santa Barbara State Historic Park and the Casa de la Guerra since 1987. In that capacity, he has overseen construction, stabilization, and restoration project at numerous historic adobes, including El Cortel Adobe from 1788, Casa de la Guerra from 1828, Pico Adobe around 1840s and the Roshin Adobe from 1856. Currently, Mr. Mali is serving as the chairperson of the board of directors for the California Missions Foundation. Wow. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. We'll be playing with the lights to get it a little bit darker so we can see the images more. Well, due to the enormous size of the crowd tonight, not use the microphone, so if you have any problems hearing me, let me know. <clears throat> and also, feel free to ask questions at any time during the talk. Um, there'll be time at the end, I'm sure, too, but um, if you see something that interests you, go ahead and stop me. So, um, as an introduction, we're going to talk briefly about Adobe as a type of earthen construction how it's used in building, and what materials are commonly used with adobe. Adobe refers to a type of sun-dried, molded mud brick, as well as the structures that are used, that they are used to construct. Um, it's a common misconception that adobe is clay. People constantly use the term adobe clay. I have horrible adobe soil in the yard. Adobe is not a type of soil. A brick or a building made with adobe bricks. Um, typically, when you make adobe, um, you don't want a lot of clay. You want a, a perfect dab mixture in, in soil, is what we typically have as a horizon topsoil around this part of Santa Barbara, and that's 60% sand, 20% silt, and 20% clay. 
The reason you want that sand in there is that it's an aggregate that helps it dry evenly. If it's all clay, um, you will create clay shrinks when it dries. So when you have a brick that's four inches thick by 22 inches long by 11 inches wide, the inside's not gonna dry at the same rate as the outside that's exposed to air. The outside's gonna dry faster and it's gonna crack. Um, if it's pure clay, it'll just crack into little rectangular pieces. Um, Monica was mentioning the current exhibition, all having a strata of adobe behind it. If you have a chance after, and you look at the edges of some of these, um, this was screen printed on what we think is probably more clay than actual adobe. And the, because the clay is going onto a wet cloth background, and then the screen print's going onto an air dried front, it's drying at a different rate, and so it's cracked the clay shrink behind the screen print. There are many types of earthen construction. This doesn't even really cover them all. But um, so these are all based on earth specifically. Um, number one, going counterclockwise, there's dugouts where you actually start in a in a lake bed or someplace where there's hard pan and you dig a structure out from the inside and the outside, leaving only the raised walls. Um, there is earth-sheltered earth space where you use a wood frame or an earthen frame dug into a hillside covered with um, earth as a roof surface. There's fill-in where you use block and fill with earth. Um, there's cut blocks like sod, um, which are cut in place. They're not molded, they're cut out of slabs of earth. Press blocks include, uh, which are all compacted, um, can be made from a manual press block machine. Uh, they can be tamped into molds. Rammed earth uses uh, forms that you put wet soil into and tamp down, and then you periodically raise those forms up to create the walls at a higher elevation. Uh, direct shaping is really common in lots of parts of Africa, and that actually does have a lot of clay in it. That's where you take your hand and you actually form the rim of a wall. Currently, there's a lot of 3D printed housing and architecture that's being, doing, that's being done that way, but you can do the same thing with extruded adobe, basically just using your hands to form the wall. Um, there are stacked earth where you're literally just taking huge units of dirt and stacking it. This does not necessarily make very clean walls, but it, it will build terraces and other types of platform for architecture. Um, and then, under the category of mold, you have the adobes. You have hand-shaped adobe, so they're being molded. They're not being made in a mold, but they're being molded by hand. And then you have hand-molded adobes where they're being pushed into wooden molds, which is what the traditional manner that we'll talk about later. Machine um, molded adobe is uh, wet mud that's basically pushed into forms with a um, mixer and a machine. <clears throat> the extruded earth uh, is another kind of pressed block, actually. Poured earth is like the ram earth, but instead of packing it in there, they're actually pouring it like cement, and when it dries, they move the horizontal boards up for another layer. Straw and clay is totally different, but it's using a framework and then filling it in with straw and clay, like cob on posts where you've got vertical and horizontal wooden members and you fill that in with earth. And then daubed earth, which is what, oddly enough, was the type of construction the very first European structures in Santa Barbara was made out of. So what makes the, the adobes, the molded, bricks unique is that they're actually brick units that are molded and they're sun dried. So adobe construction is just one type of earthen construction um, and it's very sustainable as such. It's sustainable because <coughs> materials typically come from on site so there's no cost of um, extraction or delivery. Super low energy for adobe brick production bricks are sun-dried, they don't take any electric or uh, fossil fuel energy. 
low cost maintenance with inexpensive materials that use the same dirt to patch and plaster the adobes. Production of bricks and construction of buildings is low technology yet. These buildings outperform almost all other types of construction with respect to energy. <coughs> There's other types of earthen construction, technically brick, tile, concrete, um, all, are all urban as they're based on clay, sand, silt, and other aggregates. Even glass derived from silicates and um, steel and iron from ore are urban, but there is an extremely high cost to extract and process them, uh, which makes the cost not real sustainable, especially when the fact is that those are being manufactured at unique spots and have to be delivered to almost every construction site. So, materials that are commonly used in conjunction with adobe construction. This is a typical uh, adobe wall construction. If this is the ground surface here, the soil between the ground surface and um, where it says sandy clay subsoil down here, that's the topsoil that is the best soil for making adobe bricks. So typically when you find an adobe, you're going to find somewhere very nearby where that soil was borrowed. Uh, and the reason it's not from right where the adobe is, is that you need that soil to support your foundations. The foundations are typically dug in a U-shaped trench and filled with cobbles, cemented together by mud and mortar up to a point that's 8 to 24 inches above the ground surface. Then that surface is leveled with small stones fragments of tile so that there's a nice flat surface to start laying the adobe bricks on. Um, you'll notice how square those bricks are. Um, they work a lot better that way when the corners are intact and you've got full overlap of, of the bricks on the corresponding courses. The bricks then are covered with another layer of mud which is just about identical to the matrix of the adobe bricks except it doesn't have organic additives like manure or pine needles or straw, which is typically added as a temper um, to the bricks. We'll talk about that later. So typically, as we talked about, the, the walls are laid on um, stone foundations. It's kind of hard to see here, but there's, there's a line between that portion of the site and this portion of the site. The far side has been graded, and this side is not. So you're looking at the above ground parts of the foundation here, whereas down there you're just looking at the very bottom of the courses, so there's about a two foot elevation difference. This is actually an intact leveling course, so adobe bricks would have sat right on top of that. So these are um, stone foundations that were excavated in the northwest corner of the Presidio that was reconstructed in 2004 to 2006 that you'll see later. And then the materials used to make the bricks, the adobe brick is obviously the integral unit. Um, we'll talk about the entire process later, but once the bricks have been dried, once they've been laid out, you'll see that there are they're not sitting in molds. It's also a common misconception that the bricks get laid in molds and that they sit there and dry, and when they're dry, they take them out of the molds. Uh, the side on the ground wouldn't dry very well that way. So they are actually, if the mud's poured into the molds, it's relatively stiff, stiff enough that once it's punched into all the corners, because the mold's wet and the, the, the mud is wet, they slide up pretty easily. After three to five days, the bricks are turned on their side and the corners are cleaned off of the trowel so that they're nice and square. And then they're left to dry that way anywhere from two to three weeks before they can be stacked and stored and or used. Um, talked about the mortar, which is basically used to cement both the um, stone foundation and the adobe bricks together. And as I said, it's more or less the exact same mixture without the organic additives. So, um, this is an example of stone foundation being leveled where they've already got bricks laid on the wall to either side of it. But the reason that foundation looks like it's so high off the ground is that that parcel 
have been graded. And um, before this project was over, we actually brought fill in there, about a foot and a half of fill, so that the ground surface from this done was up here. So the roofing materials include pine beams that um, were cut from up near Figueroa Mountain all, all the way down to the Presidio. Um, and then cane or uh, Arunda Donax, which is um, the giant cane that grows in all the creeks and rivers around here. It's very invasive. It was actually introduced to California by the Spanish as a building material. And then that sheeting is covered with um, fire clay tiles or tejas. The cane sheeting, um, this is the giant Arunda, and that um, basically popped up behind my office after months and months of cleaning it for using in construction. And I've left it there as an example, and we've actually harvested, I have to cut it back four or five times a year. Um, but that's the cane, it grows, it can grow to be 30 feet long. It's very, very similar structurally to bamboo. Um, unlike bamboo, you know, it's, it's a grass like bamboo. Um, it's actually a tree grass. Rather than having branches like bamboo does, that the, the koalas eat, this has sheaths or blades on top of it. And it's, it's very easy to strip, um, very easy to work with, and it lasts a long time. So here's a detail of what the roofs look like with um, round pine rafters and then um, sheets of this cane that was prefabricated on the ground um, and then set up on the roof and lashed to the pine rafters. So on top of that, you can actually, I think they've done it yet, but um, historically, they would insulate that roof with a layer of mud, just like the adobe. And then on top of that mud would go the roof tiles that would keep the mud dry. In some cases, um, in rooms that may have been used for kitchens or cooking, they did not use uh, indoor fireplaces early on, um, but they did do some cooking indoors and they typically would not insulate the roof with mud and they would actually leave gaps in the cane so that it was spaceship and smoke would go right up through the tiles. And then um, finally go the ubiquitous California Mission Roof Tile um, that were not made on the thighs of the Indians. I can tell you because the tiles from the Presidio are 24 inches long, that from my thigh comes down to about right there. So, unless there are a bunch of eight footers walking around <laughs> with perfectly conically shaped thighs on my head, um, they were made on molds like the one you see here. So, tiles, unlike uh, the adobe are made from almost pure clay, and that clay is excavated from underneath the soil that we make the adobe out of. Or in the case of here in town, a lot of the clay for adobe tiles, I mean for roof tiles and floor tiles, was excavated from the margins of the slough. Um, if you go down to where the baseball stadium, baseball field is at the high school, that cut bank all around there, if you go down from the top four or five feet, there's pure clay that you can mine out of there. Um, the kilns for the Presidio were in that direction too, so they were making the tile over there, which is typical because the firing of tiles took uh, 24 to 48 hours and took um, the kiln, not knowing what the size of the kiln here was, a um, relatively small tile kiln would take three to four cords of wood over 24 hours, so it's very smoky and um, very labor intensive, feeding that fire all night long. Now we know this because we've um, replicated this with clay from our site and made and fired tiles. I've got this image in here because it's an image done by Alexander Harmer, um, who was an artist here in town. It, he didn't see this, but it is an incredible depiction of all the activities involved in adobe construction. Down here, you have Indians with the giant cane and they're using a knife to strip the leaves off. We've got people delivering cane to the roofers. They're putting it on the pine rafters. You have 
people stacking the roof tiles over here. The Padre is there looking at construction drawings with the Native American builders. This guy's adding square beams out of round logs. And here, oxen with a dog barking at them are delivering um, round logs from the mountains. They're being dragged. Uh, and over here, you see the adobe bricks being stored to be laid. So, uh, excuse me, two questions. Did you say that the pine logs came from Figueroa Mountain? Yep, from the Presidio they did. We know when they built the mission four years later, they mistakenly used sycamore and cottonwood out of Mission Creek that needed to be replaced about three years later. How did they get it from Figueroa Mountain all the way over here? Um, that is a good question. Um, <laughs> at one point, we know they floated, they floated wood down to Longhoe, got into the San Ynez River and floated. Allegedly, that's how timber came from up north, too. There's accounts of red pine, which is what the Spanish called redwood because they'd never seen it before, um, was delivered for building. Uh, but we never saw any evidence of redwood. We've only got two standing buildings, and neither one of them had the original roof structure on them. But we did have the Casa de la Guerra to restore that was built between 1818 and 1828, and there was no redwood. And all the yellow pine family, which is locally available, and the only timber part of the Los Padres is actually the forest. My, my second question is: You said the Arundo was introduced by the Spaniards. Yeah, it's, there's an account of it being in the LA River in 1804, and there's actually there's actually mission buildings in ruins in the late 19th century where you can see cane roofs that. And it was native to Spain or somewhere. Say it's from China. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not certain. It might also be from South America, I don't recall. But um, it was definitely introduced, and I guarantee you there's a lot of uh, public works directors. Thank you. Flood control directors that would be happy to see it disappear. <laughs> it's great for us because when we do the reconstruction, it's easy for us to get. There's organizations all over the Tri Counties trying to. It, so we just get it before they put it into the chipper. So, as I mentioned, the original uh, Presidio was a type of waddle and dock construction. This is the Palisade Fork that they lived in temporarily um, for two years. And they did that because the Presidio is located on a gentle ridge. Um, Water does not tend to run uphill, so to get a steady supply of water to the site, they had to build an aqueduct that delivered water from upstream about where Rocky Mountain Park is today. And um, they had a plan for this presidio. Um, it was actually finished in 1788, and there's two um, plans. Each one dated seven, September 17, 1788, one side by the Comandante Felipe de Goitechea in Santa Barbara, the other signed by um, Governor Fajes in Mexico on September 17, 1788. Highly unlikely that happened, that they both signed them on the same day in places thousands of miles away. We think that, and, and they're slightly different. You'll see on this one, this little room here, Mark 13, which is a salon or a vestibule, just a pass from the front to the back or in the office or the living room. It's like a little hallway. In the other version of this map, you'll see that it's three times that size. We know because this map is accompanied with notes what the measurements of all these rooms are. This is correct, the other maps are not. We don't know if the difference between two maps um, represents a, an error in transcription on one copy was made to send to Mexico for his signature, or if in fact one of them is the plan or what they intended to build, and the, the one that was signed by Fajes um, was actually what was built. So they, they may differ because there was changes made during the construction. We know there was. So this plan didn't <coughs> start until <coughs> that water here. This um, is the Santa Barbara Presidio Aqueduct. And there's only a 35 foot segment of it left, but we were able to determine from the size of the channel and 
the rate of drop and the surface drag coefficient, how much water it would deliver, and at um, only an inch deep or 25% capacity, it would um, deliver 24,000 gallons of water, which is like a 20 by 40 foot swimming pool. A lot of water, enough to make adobe bricks, enough to drain. And when the reservoir that it went into overfilled because it ran 24 hours a day, the overflow was enough to irrigate crops down slope and out the front gate of the presidio. So this is a color rendering of that same 1788 plan. And there's the room that was the little tiny room on the other version of the plan. So we're going to talk about a couple of adobes that were standing, one of which was the Flores adobe, or Flores Comandancia was here, Canedo adobe is here, El Portel is here, and the Mariano Lopez adobe was right here. So Santa Barbara, Canada Street is cut through right there. So this is a plan um, found in the Edward Bisher collection, allegedly drawn um, based on what was in Santa Barbara in 1820. It's not to scale, clearly, um, as this is the mesa, and this is <laughs> dropping down to, well, this is Santa Barbara High School right here. That's the Astero. So it's the whole town between the ocean and uh, between the mountains and the mesa have been squeezed in there like a, with the two blocks. Um, there's a lot of differences around the Presidio Quadrangle, but it's in fact still a quadrangle. What's interesting about this is that we see the beginnings of Santa Barbara start to pop up outside the walls of the Presidio. And we have the Chapman adobe down here, which Joseph Chapman was married to in Ortega. Um, a Tico Casa de Arianas, um, and a number of other adobes showing up between the front gate of the Presidio and uh, the Embarcadero. So there's two roads leaving the Presidio. One is the Camino Para El Embarcadero, or the Anchorage, and the other one is the Camino Para San Buenaventura. And there's a coastal road that connects the two. So by 1852, there's a lot development outside the Presidio. Here's what's left of the Presidio. There's only two sides of it left by 1852. The other two sides are in ruins. There's the Casa de la Guerra. Uh, these are part of the Presidio Gardens um, that eventually came to be part of de la Guerra property, but were part of the gardens that were established when the Presidio was built from irrigation water that came from up near Mission Creek. Um, so again, you can see there's quite a bit of development outside of the walls. So in 1853, the city commissioned um, a survey of the city by Salisbury Haley and then Vetus Wackenrider drew two maps of the street grid. This is a map of the downtown area showing the names of the residents of the adobes. The, you would recognize the names of all of them, I'm sure. Um, you can see that there is now kind of an alignment of structures, commercial structures, happening over what eventually becomes State Street. It's because of this concentration of commercial structures that the grid that Haley drew was laid out parallel to State Street. Instead of parallel to the Presidio and all the parcels around the Presidio that were given to people. Consequently, um, there's a lot of weird property lines um, in the downtown area. So 1853, those are all adobes. Um, so one of the adobes that was there was the Flores Comandancia. This has now uh, been reconstructed. This is an original Presidio adobe that was, it's now covered with wood siding in there, obviously, and occupied, occupied by a Chinese laundry called the Haiwan Laundry. But that adobe um, was occupied by 
Gumacindo Flores' wife, Maria, who was, um, he was the last Mexican commandante and surrendered to American forces in that building in 1846. She still lived in the house in the 1890s when they started to finally lay the street grid out and sue the city because her house formerly extended into the middle of the street and she lost that suit. And, uh, there was only one place in town where they actually jogged around property and that's the weird little rock in front of the historical museum one day of the year where that really fun intersection is. <laughs> what were they jogging around? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. There was a De La Guerra, Santiago De La Guerra Adobe um, was by the Meridian Studios. That could have been it. I mean, Casa De La Guerra wasn't going anywhere either. I, I don't know how it got, they went where the road was. It didn't line up with where they projected it beyond that. Um, so Mariano Lopez Adobe, um, this is Canna Perito Street right here. He also lost a lawsuit. Mariano Lopez was a judge in town. So this section between right there and right there is the original Presidio over to right there. His, these are the foundations of his building going out into the street, right there and right there. When the city knocked that part of the building down, he picked up all the bricks and built an L-shaped addition to his house and, and the front porch facing the new Canon Perdido Street. Uh, this is the Canedo Adobe in the 1940s. Um, that yeah. was remodeled in 1948 by Elmer Whitaker, who is now the visitor center for the Presidio. El Cortel, which is the oldest building in Santa Barbara, it's the second oldest building in the state of California, and the oldest building in the California State Park System. Undoubtedly the oldest residence in California. So, excuse me. Um, over by the, the fountain, the elephant fountain, uh -huh. quarter, somewhere over there, there's another building that says El Cortel. Yeah. It's got like a big plaque on it. So is that wrong? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so that old building back there for City Avenue, if you ever yeah, look at Presidio that, Avenue, the big right. two-story complex between the post office and the corner, that whole thing was developed in 1944 as um, a hotel, it was a one-stop shop for servicemen coming back from the war to get married, have their honeymoon, and move on. Um, there was a hotel, a chapel, and a restaurant, <laughs> all right there. You can see where the chapel was in the corner with the big bell. Yeah. So they took it upon themselves because one wall off Canterbury Street incorporates part of an adobe wall. I've seen it exposed. It's a section of adobe like this way. There's also an adobe wall in the back but none of it is any part of an adobe that had anything to do with the Presidio. And there's that tapestry back there that it calls out that whole complex as the Presidio. That's the chapel. I mean, it's, it's yeah, really, it's, especially <laughs> so if, you, if you wander on to Presidio Avenue, and that's the first thing you see. Okay. So this is El Portel today. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so, of those four buildings that were part of the original Presidio Quadrangle, two of them survived. Um, 1925 Santa Barbara earthquake. I, did, I wasn't able to show you the 1903 Sanborn, but you can see how few adobes are left um, after that 1853 depiction. Because in 1857, um, the Fort Tejon earthquake hit. I don't know why they call it Fort Tejon, it was a lot closer to a lot farther north than that, but that, that earthquake was one of, if not the strongest earthquake recorded. 7.9 magnitude, and it did damage from Mission Dolores in San Francisco to the San Diego Mission. Mm -hmm. It flattened um, the Presidio Chapel here. It flattened the mission for the second time. Uh, this was 1857. So by eight, 1903, there's there's literally 20% of those buildings you saw in the 1850s. And of that 20%, at least half of them went down in 1925. <laughs> so, um, there's four, the Secretary of the Interior um, has standards for the treatment of historic properties. There's four treatments, preservation, rehabilitation, 
restoration and reconstruction. I'm going to talk briefly about um, how those standards apply to um, adobes now. Preservation focuses on maintenance and repair of existing historic materials and retention of a property's form as it evolved over time. So you're literally presenting, you know, preserving something as it is, all the layers being equal. Um, and at this point, that has been done at the Canado Adobe, El Portel, and the Pico Adobe in the park. Um, this is an example of a preservation project at El Portel, again, the oldest building in Santa Barbara. During the 1920s, concrete was cheap. And it was very popular to repair what few adobes were left with concrete. Um, adobe suffers from a phenomenon called basal erosion, um, which happens when water comes off the eaves, hits the ground, creates a little trench with water in it, and then splashes back up onto the bottom of the wall. You end up getting this coved erosion at the bottom of the wall. There you can see where how bad that erosion was, and they patched it with concrete almost 18 inches thick. So we took that out in segments and sawtooth new adobe back into it. And there is no more concrete in that building. Uh, rehabilitation is when you acknowledge the need to alter a building um, or a historic property to make continue and change its use. We did that, uh, we've done that with a lot of buildings, but because we're just talking about Adobe, I'll just mention the machine. And um, we went through a long, drawn out process of getting permission to put cedar shingles back on this building because it's occupied by a school, it's in a high fire area, and it's in a no wood roof neighborhood. Um, but we were able to go to HLC, show them the original shingles on the original roof framing, um, and uh, make an argument for taking off the nine layers of comp that we put on the roof um, so that we could put the shingle roof back on. And we used treated shingles and um, the Historic Landmarks Commission agreed and um, gave their endorsement to the building department and the fire marshal and we were allowed to put this back um, the way it was. The inside of the building really wasn't changed, we just changed the use um, from a residence which it had been for years and years to offices and classrooms. Then restoration depicts a property at a particular period of time or removing all other periods. So this is what we did at the Casa de la Guerra when we started the building. Had gone through major remodels during the 1920s of the original construction of El Paseo and then again in the 30s and 40s as El Paseo was remodeled. So it had retail display windows cut into it, it had 13 fireplaces added to it, all kinds of windows that weren't original. Um, so as part of the restoration, we removed all those elements and put adobe back where there was concrete and glass. This is the end of the west wing of the Casa as it was being finished ready for plaster. Now, the Casa was restored to the time period basically that coincided with Jose de la Guerra's lifetime. He died um, in 1858, and the Casa was um, damaged to some degree during the 1857 Fort Tone earthquake, enough so that all the doors, the heavy inset doors and windows, all got wrapped enough that they had to be replaced. When they did that, um, they took the opportunity to modernize and they actually replaced all those inset wood doors and windows with glass panel Victorian doors and windows out on the surface of the porch. Um, and because that happened after the 14th, the Fort Tejon earthquake, we made that cut off Jose's lifetime and um, basically it's all pre-1857 earthquake. So that includes these adobe columns which were destroyed in that earthquake. I often walk past the casa and notice that there is some maybe erosion or something and then a day later there's a patch and then a day so there's like this consistent patching system. Yeah. yeah a lot of that wear and tear on the sidewalk and stuff from the mess not necessarily um, 
the elements, which it ordinarily would have been, that would have been a lot more regular thing to, I mean, something you would do seasonally, but yeah, we have to deal with people. <laughs> You're the worst. <laughs> So reconstruction recreates vanished and non-surviving portions of the property for interpretive purposes. So as you know, a large portion of the Presidio has been reconstructed going back to 1979. Um, this is an aerial photo of the northeast corner of reconstruction. I like the harbor painting, I like it because you can see a lot of things going on. There's a little model of the finished building in front of it, I like that, <laughs> for scale. Um, but there are, ex there's foundations exposed, there's roof framing going up, there's walls being laid, there is beams being added over here. So, what's different from the way they make bricks then and the way we make bricks now is that the materials are essentially the same as when the mud was mixed in pits historically. Um, but now we mix the mud in plaster mixers to ensure that all the clods are broken down. You used to, if, if particularly hard dirt clods were in the soil, they would use draft animals to tread over it to break it up like they would with clay to make pots um, because you need that mud, the, the pads or cloths to break completely down into a plastic form. Because reconstruction is considered new construction, we have to um, use an additive to make the bricks meet compressive strength required by the modern building codes. And since the 70s, they've been using an asphalt emulsion, which is basically the same kind of really light oil that they use to water sand roads. It's, they spray it out of trucks to oil roads. Um, and about a gallon of that goes into 100 gallons of mixed material. So it's a, it's a small amount. It doesn't smell. It doesn't discolor the bricks. It increases their compressive strength and it makes them a lot less permeable to the water. It's not so important for building, but when you build them and store them, it's really nice when they can sit stored for a long time because it takes a long time to make them. Yeah. I was going to ask you earlier, actually, the original adobe bricks, um, why was the uh, organic plant material added to the, uh, to the mixture? What? It's put in there as a temper, as kind of a bonding agent, um, and it works to some degree. Manure doesn't work as well. I mean, it depends how chewed up the manure was, but grass, straw, and pine needles usually work. It also helps it to dry more evenly, a little bit. But that material is not used anymore in these... Yeah, we, used to, we still use straw. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh. I yeah, it's the same, it's the same material. We, we do use straw. We just have to add the asphalt emulsion. Uh -huh. Some people, depending on where you are, I'm, I'm, it's insane. People build with adobe where there's not good soil to use it, so they're digging up clay, they have to have sand brought in, and they have to mix it. It's extremely labor-intensive and expensive. And what, so at the Presidio, we've excavated all the areas we can use the soil to make bricks from, so we buy it from the Battistinis at Santa Barbara Sand and Topsoil on Goleta, who have a special adobe mix for us, where they mix a sandy loam with a clay soil, and we get, boom, 60 So now there's the beast that had the dirt and water and it's straw in those black bags right there, by the way. Um, you have to constantly check the mixture because you want it to be plastic enough so that the paddles are turning around and not killing the mixer, but you don't want to get too watery either. It has to be, uh, usually a lot of, frequently the first batch of the day it gets to the molds and it comes out and it's either too dry or too wet and that information gets back to the mixer and it gets rectified. So it gets dumped into wheelbarrows and taken to the molds, dumped in the mold. See, that looks very dry. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then, um, really, the most important process of the whole thing is punching it into the holes. And that is to ensure that the mud gets all the way down to those far corners. Otherwise, you pull those molds up, and the top corners are scrammed, but the bottom of them all look like a loaf of bread. And um, it's just not very stable. You're relying on the mortar to hold them vertical instead of the flat surface. And so, any wall that you build with something like that, just like if you're using hand formed bricks, they're going to be a little less stable. They're going to be more mortar than, they're going to have more mortar um, in comparison to adobe material. So once it's punched down into the corners, you use a wet hand um, or a trowel to smooth it off. And then, uh, Yeah, I think the trick is not stepping on them or <laughs> you go to back up and there's another row of six inches behind you. These bricks, by the way, are not, you'll see other pictures, typical 11 by 22 by 4 inch bricks. They're veneer bricks. They're only 4 by 4 by 22. So those things look a little funny. So, um, continuing on with the reconstruction, we now use continuous sandstone footings that are built on continuous um, concrete footings. Um, and that's different from the 70s and 80s where they actually removed all the sandstone from the archaeological dig, poured a concrete wall, and then put the stone veneer on the outside. Now, um, and I don't have a picture to show you, but that northeast corner reconstruction, we had completely intact wall foundations, including two rooms where we had standing adobe on the walls. We didn't want to remove that material and replace it with concrete. Um, so we, and engineers came up with a method where we dug caissons. We basically hand removed soil, uh, or hand removed the stones at the intersections of walls, and then um, pour reinforced concrete beam there that ties to the concrete top on the top of the wall. Uh, so the adobe walls, the walls are 96% adobe, but they're filling in a concrete frame, which again has to do with modern seismic code. So there's the foundation, and again, it looks like this foundation is four feet off the ground. It's because it is fill fill went in up to the threshold of the door there. Um, as I mentioned, the intersections of the walls have vertical steel and concrete posts. These horizontal um, concrete beams go in at the top of the wall, so that's the steel cage. It's going to get a veneer of those 4x4 four four blocks like we were just building that will look just like these, but then a concrete beam is part of the side of that. Here's the concrete bond beam on the gable showing, but you can see that on the side here it's been covered with the adobe veneer. Beams from the forest and the round rafters being installed. Cane sheeting, and this is a real pain because um, the cane is considered a crushable material. We can't nail through it, so every single piece has to be cut to 22 inches between these furring strips. So plywood sheeting gets nailed to that solid wood strip. So every one of these, there's like staple at the end of every one of those pieces of cane. I did the front porch in front of the commandancy. It took me like three days to do 30 foot of 10 foot wide roof. Very labor intensive. Um, there's the first quarter of mud plaster and the roof's been finished so that there's actually been adobe mud pushed through the top of the cane so that if you go into the building and look up, you'll see mud dripping through. And then it's been covered with regular uh, construction underlayment. And then it's hard to see, but on top of that are rows of braided copper, which the, uh, that the roof tiles all get tied to for seismic purposes. Again. Historically, gravity held them up there. They were set in a bed of mortar, so a little bit of earthquake they can slide right off when they did. So there's the building being whitewashed and the roof stacked. And um, that's the building process without cutting all the, 
cutting the hides for the rawhide strip and we cut all the trees down in the national forest and milled all the lumber for the doors and windows. All the stain on the woods made from iron oxide that comes out of the archaeological excavation. So that building went up. Santa Barbara Contractors Association, the tile, building or the roof tile. Where did that how'd that came from? That came from Tecate, Mexico, <laughs> but um, that's because it's made by hand and low fire, um, as opposed to machine made high fire, which most of the commercial tile is. Um, <coughs> so, two of those projects, El Portal and um, the Canedo Adobe, are, are two the only two original buildings, both dating to the 1780s in the park, and we are currently waiting to find out any day now, as of the 10th of January, if we are going to be awarded um, Prop 68 nonprofit park operators funds to do a couple of big projects, one of which is a seismic retrofit and roof replacement at El Hortel, and the other is a roof restoration of the Canedo Adobe and Padre's Horse, that whole length from the chapel to the end. Um, needs to be re-roofed badly. And it's not as simple as it sounds because part of it is um, original 1786 walls with a 1948 roof and 1948 doors and windows and 1948 porch adjacent to a reconstructed 1780s building with hand axed beams and columns, and cane sheeting. Uh, so there's two types of craftsmanship that need to be done right against each other to complete the project. And with El Portel, the roof needs to come completely off in order to do a seismic retrofit, where there will be um, a bond beam or, or strap, either elastic or steel strap, placed at the top of the wall <coughs> and pinned into the top of the wall, and then the roof replaced with uh, round rafters, which we know from archaeological evidence, and um, cane sheeting, and large hand fire uh, low fire roof tiles. El Portel now, if you look at it, has small 1920s machine made high fire roof tiles on it that were made in Los Angeles. And they don't look right. So, is the Canada Adobe the uh, Whittaker Adobe, that 48 construction you're talking about? Yeah. 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 Um, and that's, this is just one part of the park now. That's the Canada Adobe, and El Portel is right here. Um, and they are open 363 days a year, <laughs> if you're ever interested in going by. And my Casa de la Guerra is open from noon to four, Tuesday through Sunday as well. Any questions? Yeah, I'm kind of so away. In the, maybe many people here have had this experience. When I first was in Europe, in Spain, just last year, and I noticed that many of the old towns that had a wall around them still have the wall, but you kind of drive through right. it, and then you get to the middle, and modern stuff is going on, but the wall is there to give you a sense of what used to be. Is there a plan to, in any way, recreate or mark on the ground the original perimeter so that you get that sense? Um, as you know, because you were around at the time all the hearings were going on, there was a plan to completely close the streets, right? And right. put that outer wall around it and have Cana Perito and Santa Barbara Street run into a one-way circle that went around the outside of the floor. Um, and obviously that didn't happen. We started in the early 90s putting the inlay of the wall across the street. It was it, it was like a six year project to get it's because of the it's because it's in the city right away to get the licensing to do the encroachment in the city right away took years to do and so then I came up with the idea of using traffic panel which we did experimentally over in this parking lot behind Panino's and um, we got complaints from one of the tenants about the giraffe graffiti. Because it was a brown background with like gold sandstone cobbles being around. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we still might try to do that, and, and we do have an encroachment plan over here, not to bring, not to pinch the sidewalk in, but just to put the inlay on the sidewalk and the um, and the street. But we've had a shift in the last few years. 
forward just trying to take care of all the buildings we have and not building new ones that we can't take care of. So there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff to take care of. We have I have so I oversee all the property management. We have 35 historic buildings in the four block area, all five of town house down there. So it's a lot of old problems. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.